It's the Bigger Than Me podcast with your hosts, Aaron P. Today, I have the privilege of sitting down with a person I am a huge fan of, Lorne Cardinal. I have been following his journey for a very long time. He's been an inspiration to me since I was a young man, uh, tuning into Corner Gas as a young person. It's such a privilege to sit down with you today, Lorne. Would you mind introducing yourself for people who might not be acquainted? Sure. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Lorne Cardinal. I'm the Cree from Northern Alberta. I am an actor, director, producer, and uh, pretty regularly handsome, good-looking guy. I couldn't agree more. Could we start mm-hmm. off with your community, Sucker Creek First Nation? You started yeah. there. Can you tell us about uh, your community and where you come from? I, I come from uh, Sucker Creek First Nation, which is uh, in northern Alberta, about four hours north of Edmonton, uh, on the shores of Lesser Slave Lake. Um yeah, we're Cree, and uh, yeah, I, I lived there for a while. Grew up there. Uh, I've got cousins and family and sisters there, and uh, that's that's my home res, Sucker Creek. What lessons do you think you were influenced by as a young person coming from your community? Oh, lessons. Uh, the importance of family is is a big is a big thing there because you know we're all, we have we sick, I come, the Cardinals are such a large family. Uh, we spread all over North, uh, Northern Alberta and Saskatchewan and just everywhere. And, and being Cree, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're movers. We, uh, we, uh, we have the, the traveling gene in our feet. So we spread all over the place, you know, I've got, uh, uh, and there's, uh, our ancestors come from like far away as France and Scotland and intermixed. And, uh, yeah, we have a, a huge long lineage. What inspired you to decide to go to the University of Alberta for fine arts? Was there something going on in your world? What pulled you in this direction? Well, it was kind of a, it was a long journey. I didn't uh, discover acting until I was like in my 20s, early 20s, uh, before I did my first acting class was in uh, a place called Caribou College, which is now Thompson Rivers University in, uh, in Kamloops. Uh, I moved there and... Uh, Back then, it was uh, unemployment rate was about seventeen percent, and the skills I had was the darkroom technician, photographer, and tree planter, and uh, and uh, rugby player. Those are the the extent of my world at that point. And uh, uh, I, I know Kamloops didn't need any of those things, so uh, there was a college behind where I was living, and I went, oh, "I'm gonna go put my treaty rights to work." and Walked in the door and said, I want to enroll. And uh, I started picking classes here and there and, uh, and, uh, got accepted. And then, uh, and then I phoned my band and said, Hey, I, I just enrolled in college. I need some, uh, you know, some, uh, some of that book money and stuff. And they went, You're not supposed to do it that way. You gotta, and I went, Oh, well, it's already happened. So they were kind of like, Oh, okay. Well, we'll deal with those guys. And, and so, yeah, so I got, uh, did my first year of college and, uh, I was just picking stuff I liked. I had no idea about prerequisite programs or what you need to get a diploma or, or a degree. So I was just taking, you know, sports history, a little bit of English, I like by science. I was curious about science. And so I made up my schedule and then I went, oh, look, I've got a room for one more class. And I saw an introduction to acting and I went, oh, easy credits. <laughs> and I was so- lucky because I, I got, I got uh, my, instructor that I had is professor dr david edwards who was uh who was just a you know an incredible lovely man who loved theater and acting and the craft of acting and he was my first instructor so his his uh passion for acting rubbed off on me and i did because i'm uh, i i'm and still am you know deal with shyness i'm a very naturally shy shy person i hated standing up and talking in front of people that was my nightmare um and uh so i took this acting class and it taught me how to how to do that how to stand up and deliver and speak to people or even be looking at a crowd of people who are looking at me and so i did my first one act play there and i was on stage and we did finish the show and we did taking our curtain call and i had the epiphany right where everything just goes wavy and i'm just like wow and i went this is it this is what i meant i was meant to do because i felt so comfortable and and there was no stress. I felt so relaxed on stage playing another, playing a character. And I went, this is it. And so I asked my teacher, how do I, uh, how do I make a living at this? How do I do this as a profession? And he gave me the best advice was, uh, the, he says, get the best training you can find. And so that's what I did. And that's how I ended up at the U of A. 
I'm curious as to what the impact was on the listeners, on the viewers who are able to see you doing this. Is there a relationship you have in that in that early stage where you start to see that they're also completely immersed in who you are in that moment, in this character that you're portraying? Yeah, it's it's a, it's a, it's a gift, and it's one of those moments that you keep chasing. It's a very addictive because when you connect with the audience and you can and you're and you're in the scene and it's very tense or something. And you stop and all of a sudden your, your, your inside voice goes, no one is breathing in the audience because they're so engrossed in what you're doing. They stop breathing because they're so tense. And, and, and that's happened like, I, you know, there's a handful of times that it's, it's happened and it's, uh, it's, it's magical. And that's what you keep pursuing to try and get that connection, try and make it as believable and truthful as possible in your performance, right? You don't ever want to be caught acting on stage because it's death. You don't want to be acting. You want to be telling the truth of a story, of a situation, of a, a human being. And that's why, I, that, and that's why you spend all the years, uh, uh, learning your craft, the technique of acting, the craft of acting. It's more than just standing up there saying lines. You have to d- dive deep into a character and find out what makes them tick, what their fears are, what their wants are, and all that kind of work that you do beforehand. That was my next question is around this embodying another person and fully mm-hmm. experiencing what they're seeing and what their perspectives might be thinking about how you put yourself in somebody else's shoes genuinely to mm-hmm. bring out these concepts and help people understand a person's perspective that you're portraying. What yeah. was those ex- early experiences like for you? Well, I remember the first time, uh, one of my first plays I did, I did the ecstasy of Rita Joe uh, for the Walter Dale uh, community theater in Edmonton, which is, you know, community theater. It's, it is what it is. It's, uh, local people getting together, put on a show. So I auditioned before I took any acting classes. It was one, of, it was one of my third play I've ever done in my life. And I went for, uh, Jamie Paul was a character, um, uh, yeah, written by James Riga. So it was, you know, like, uh, it's all about, uh, Ecstasy of Rita Joe. I don't know if you know it or not, but it's, uh, it's one of those, uh, Seminal Canadian theater plays written by a non-native guy, but a guy, George Riga, who knew the indigenous community and voice and spirit. So he, he wrote this play about a young girl and life off the res going into the city and, uh, and just the injustice of the Canadian justice system. And it's, you know, it's a lot of, uh, it's a, it's a timeless play because not much has changed since he wrote it in the sixties, right? right. So uh, the political situation, social situation hasn't changed much from those days. You know, there's still injustice. There's still people, you know, especially our people getting wrongfully incarcerated or overly incarcerated. It's like it's a sport with uh, <laughs> the mainstream crowd, you know, the justice crowd. Yeah, throw them in jail. Um, but uh, uh, I did that play and it was very emotional and very lot of anger in it and stuff. And I didn't have any technique, any craft. So we did the rehearsal, and then when we did opening night, there's extra juice in it because it's live people. People, a live audience comes in to watch, and there was a buzz around town. And so I went, and I just went all out, and I got connected to the emotion of it. But I didn't have any craft, any technique. So after about two shows, I started losing my voice by the end of the play because I had no idea on how to use my breath, how to breathe, how to use it as a tool. So the the week run that we had was very hard because I would stop talking after the end of the show and I wouldn't talk till the next day before rehearsal because my voice would last only so long before we start powering out again. So that was one of the benefits of, of getting theater training was learning how to deal with that and, you know, connecting to emotional things and using your breath and your body and your whole body as a toolbox so you can hit those emotional things and still save your the physical structure of your voice. And you learn that by taking all these classes, speech classes. They weren't kidding when they said, we'll teach you how to speak, we'll teach you how to breathe, and we'll teach you how to move. And, uh, and, and they were true to their word. And they, they taught me that just the, just the technical aspects of acting, what you need to do a show eight times a week and twice on Wednesday. Is there a technique that stands out to you personally that, that will never leave your mind or one that, that had an impact on you? Oh yeah. I mean, before I went, cause, uh, there's two, there's all kinds of training you can get out there. There's the, all different forms of art that you, that are performance based. 
uh, one one thing I was exposed to before I, I got into the university, I did a play, and we had an eight week rehearsal period, and part of that process was called the Pachinko Clown Method, and it was a little red red nose European clown, and and that whole training is very unique, and it's very uh, centered on. It, it was centered on uh, indigenous philosophy of color, the color wheel. So you do a lot of what we call color work, where you take a color and you focus on the color, you breathe, and then you bring in the color. You let it. So all you're doing is you're breathing, you're clearing your mind, and you're just thinking of that color. And these emotions come out, and it's about tapping into those kind of emotions and going with that. So you use these colors, and then you also use mask work as well to tap into these different energies and and uh and things that are around every human being it just takes a lot of work to turn off that conscious mind you know the analytical brain we have to you take a lot of training to turn that off because you don't want to you don't want to be criticizing yourself because you're you're cutting opportunities off when you do that when you hear that little voice going oh you're gonna look down you're gonna be that you know that voice it takes a lot of work to shut it off you know because it's so prevalent in mainstream society but as performers and artists and musicians and painters, there there comes a moment where we find that place where we can shut off the brain and just go with the impulse that comes. I'm just going to go this way. I'm not going to plan it. I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to grade it or or think it means this. You know, in, in, imbue it with emotions or or you just go with it and see where it goes and see what happens. And and when you're working with a group of people who are all in the same vein magic happens because offers are being made right and you just go and go then you're venturing to new territory that you never even thought was possible because you're just going with it saying yes let's or yes let's that's the game yes let's you don't say why or maybe if maybe you know you go yes let's let's try it let's go and then when you when you start tapping into that kind of training you know incredible incredible things happen and then you go into the european style theater training which is what i did at the u of a the Bachelor of Fine Arts Acting Program is classical theater training, where you learn how to stand and speak, and you study, you analyze scripts, you analyze words, you analyze characters, you find the character in the words, which is very different from my initial training of letting the spirit come in and letting colors and wind and directions and and uh, all these things move you around. You know, we don't. It's it's a different training. So I had to. I'm well, not unlearned, but put my clown training to the side and focus on the more classical theater training of how to stand, how to, because that's we took ballet uh, hour and a half every day for three years. Ballet class was our first class of the day. How to stand, how to use your body as a tool, how to how how your body speaks when you're on stage. Uh, you're letting the audience, giving audience, even if you have no line, your, your audience, your posture, your your posture is giving the audience information of what story is so if you know if there's young actors out there go i don't got any lines i'm just in the background no you're not just in the background you're giving information to the audience about what's happening to the scene and the actor so your job is to have some attitude to what's going on are you involved how do you feel about it is it nerve-wracking is it scary are you ready to run or are you ready to jump in and break it up you know whatever posture you take on stage you're giving the audience information so it's Anybody who says, I'm just standing there, it's like, well, then that's what you're doing. You're just standing there. You're not engaging. When you yeah. talk about getting into the moment, I just interviewed Dr. Chris Bertram about flow states, and he talks about mm. getting into the zone and really letting go of the future and forgetting about past mistakes you've made and just experiencing that. And that just really stood out to me that acting has this as well. That That is right. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's, there's, you know, all kinds of body work you can do just based on breathing, uh, you know, releasing trauma. There's a lot of it, you know, and that's the thing that uh, that we learn quite on as, as acting students is that theater training is not therapy. <laughs> you do that on the other side. What, you're, what we learn is the craft of acting techniques on how to tell the truth and find characters and use words and the, technic, the technical aspects of, of speaking Shakespeare, you know, finding out what that means, unlocking the key to Shakespeare. It's it's amazing because it's some of the most brilliant writing in human history. Uh, this one man did it and create created words. He invented words, but uh, you know he was also uh, when you unlock the key to Shakespeare, the rhythm, the move, the the words he uses, just it's a joy to speak when you do it. 
So uh, that that's what we get. Uh, you know, you train a lot in is learning how to do that and using your breath, always breathing. And no matter what training you do, it's all centers around breath. Even martial arts, you got to breathe. And when you're running, you got to learn how to use your breath. How do you you know how to use it for energy and use it to evoke emotion or subdue emotion? It's all when people say just breathe. That's true. As it's happened to me before when I've been on stage and I'd forget my line. All of a sudden, they'd just be empty vacuum, <laughs> be nothing there, right? And I was going like, oh, my God. And what I did when my first year was, see, and just doing that, I'm locked. I'm tense. I, there's this, that my throat is tense. My shoulders, ah, my eyes are popped open. They're, it's tense. What's happening physiologically is, there's no oxygen getting into my brain in my body. So once I stop breathing and lock up, it's like I, I, I'm lost. Somebody else has got to come in and save me or, or we'll start again or, you know, it's just a nightmare. But what you do when you're that, it's gone. It's upset is you just relax and keep breathing and keep breathing, and keep feeding the brain oxygen. And those, that, those words will come back because that's why we rehearse so much too. It's in there. It's in there. You just got to relax and let the fear go <laughs> and keep feeding the brain oxygen and it will come back to you eventually. And then you just, how smooth that you, because the audience doesn't know, they don't have a script in front. They don't know you forgot your line. They don't know you just jumped two pages. They don't know. <laughs> just as long as the story makes sense, you know, and then that's when you try and uh, fake it. But this is the usual uh, sign to the audience members that there's something in trouble. When someone's in trouble on stage, they, they see this. <laughs> they go, oh, this should be interesting. <laughs> uh... I want to get your thoughts on culture. You mentioned Shakespeare. I think culture is something that nourishes our soul. When mm -hmm. we think about having a connection as a society, agreeing on things, I think this is where we go to find it. So many people don't know what Shakespeare meant in his plays. We know the name. We don't always know what he intended or what he was talking about. And I think this is the same for indigenous culture. There's values yeah. and stories and belief systems that not everybody knows about. So it's a way of kind of connecting us all to a shared story. And I'm wondering from your perspective, what does it mean to go to a play what does it mean to go to a theater and experience something like a show and and really connect with these characters well it's it's it, I, I i look at it as a contract you you make a contract an unconscious contract with the performers on stage that you are coming in to watch and hear the story they're telling and 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 their job as audience members is to sit and listen and watch and 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 uh and go along for the ride. You know, uh, it's not uh, about texting time or, you know, making sure you you turn off your damn phones. <laughs> First thing you do before you hit, turn off your damn phones. Oh, it's on vibrate. It doesn't matter because you take it out, screen comes up and it attracts and people's, uh, distracts people around you and it distracts the actors on stage as well. So your initial contract as a theater goer is to, is to not be a distraction but to add support and listen to the story and the quality of the storytelling. That's what will, um, that's what will, the audience will let the actors know if they're doing a good job or not, just by their response. If the director is terrible and the actors are just off in all directions, you're, the audience is going to respond. They're going to be polite. They're going to sit there, but they're going to be flipping through their magazines. They're going to be shifting. They're going to be, cough they'll start the nervous coughing and this and that but that means they're unfocused they're not listening which means the performers on stage aren't doing their job which is being clear and concise and truthful and that's the director's job and that's the actor's job to make sure the story they're telling is focused and and centered in truth you know if you go see a comedy what you should what uh, as a as an actor i don't think of oh i'm going to be funny it's the time to be funny I look at it as a tragedy and how, because the character doesn't know what's happening. The character doesn't know he's in the comedy. The character doesn't know he's making jokes or, or you're saying lines. You know, that's a playwright's job. The actor's job is to say it as innocently as, as possible. And the comedy comes from the situation of the, the, the character not understanding what he's involved in because there's a bigger, the bigger stage picture that the audience gets to see 
the characters don't get to see and they don't know what's coming. They don't know what happened when they weren't on stage, you know? And that's, and that's the, the world that you create. And that's where the comedy comes in is when, when people see somebody who doesn't know and start saying words that are directly conflicting what just happened before, you know, and they're saying it with such honesty and passion. But once you start seeing the, ah, I'm going to put on an acting funny face, it's like the audience goes, Oh boy. <laughs> they close up. They either go, Oh, here we go. And he thinks he's being funny because he's acting funny. He's goof. Yeah. So, you know, as an actor, it's just like the first thing is like, if it's a comedy, don't act funny. If it's a drama, don't act all angry and angst. Find the truth of the story. It's always about the truth. And that's what the audience comes to see is truth. And, and the more that an actor can find the character and tell their story and experience their story. Uh, cause there's two, you know, there's two worlds. There's a character and then there's the actor. The actor knows everything. The character knows nothing. Right. And that's where you have to be as the actor. You have to come in as the character and experience everything for the first time. Even though as the actor, you've done it 300 times in rehearsal. Every time you hit the stage, you're doing it for the first time. You're hearing it for the first time. So those are kind of emotional and mental states that you have to work yourself. And that's why technique and training is so important to learn how to get yourself into those states. So everything is new and, and fresh and you don't, and you're not, uh, ex you're not expecting what's coming next as a character. You're expecting a word. You're expecting the set, you know, once you start anticipating what's coming, then you're, you're, you've lost the thread. You can't anticipate what's coming because the person doesn't know the character does not know what's coming, has never experienced it before, doesn't know. And that's a state you have to be in for the whole play. You can you only deal with what happened after. Do you think the work you do enriches our social fabric, helps connect us and understands ourselves in a deeper way? Absolutely. Absolutely. Every performer, actor, artist, uh, sculptor, we're all, we're all, working in the human experience it's a universal human experience it doesn't matter uh what we bring as like my cultural background my cree heritage i bring in through the through the words i bring my emotional history into the words that are written by william shakespeare 500 years before still has resonance because he deals in human emotions all of shakespeare's plays are human emotions greed power lust uh, you know, vengeance, anger, all human emotions. So anybody can plug into it. The words you need to, to understand and work at it. It is a language. It does take technique and understanding because the words were written 500 years ago. There are different meanings to the words. So you have to go find out the, the meaning of the word at the time. It helps you uncode. The, the, what he's saying. So what, what we do is we go line by line by line and then paraphrase it. Now is the winter of our discontent. Okay. What does that mean? Is he talking about the weather or is he now he's now right now in this time, whatever's happening here now, he's talking to the audience. Now is the winter of our discontent. Our discontent is now gone to sleep. It's, it's gone to hibernate. So our discontent, war, or whatever was troubling our world is gone now, you know? And that's the kind of mining you have to do with every word. Made glorious summer by this son of York. Made what? So now it's, now it's not winter anymore. It's glorious. It's summer. It's, well, it's full of life. It's lush. It's, you know, good time by this son of York. Now there's a little bit of work there to be done. This son of York, is it? The, the son, as in father son, is it the son of the Lord York or is he the son of the summer? Now he's the summer. So and that's, and then you find out that, you know, Richard wants to be king. He's not, his brother is. So, and he lets you know right in the first opening act, he doesn't like it because he's got a humpback. He's misshapen and he wants to be king. But now everyone's in peace and, and there's no war. There's, you know, it's, it's not working in his favor because everyone loves peace and they love, the, they love the king now because he brought peace to the kingdom. You know, there's no more wars. People don't have to die. And he's going, but I've got a plan. And he shares the plan with the audience. Watch me. And then they watch as he goes and puts his plan into motion, gets his brother to be in deadly hate, the one against the other. 
And, uh, you know, it's exciting. It's kind of like, okay. And then you watch him unfold his plan and the audience is going, Oh my God, can't they see what he's doing and how he's manipulating everything? And it's, yeah, it's, it's exciting stuff. Can you talk to us about emotions? Right now we're in a time where depression is commonplace, anxiety is commonplace, and it seems like actors, people like yourself, are able to uh, allow us to experience and understand those emotions from a new perspective. But it seems like you would have to work somewhat harder to get to those places than the average person so you understand what it looks like, what it feels like, what it's going to look like to the audience in a deeper way than the average person understands when they're sad, when they're Mm -hmm. frustrated, when they're stressed. You want, it seems like you'd understand these emotions in a deeper way. Can you talk to us about what it's like to embody this? It, it is. It, it's a challenge. And it's also one of these things where you have to, um, when you're dealing with emotions, you have to care for yourself first. You have to make sure that your, your creative spark is protected um, because you're diving into it a lot. You can't overextend it. So you have to know when to take a rest, take a break, recharge it, let the energies come back. And it takes, you know, re- reading books, going for a holiday, going for uh, biking or whatever. There's all kinds of things that replenish. You have to replenish yourself because if you, you keep going, you keep driving, you keep depleting it, it's, it's, it leads to burnout. And it's really hard to reconnect the spark once it's out because you're exhausted me- mentally, physically, spiritually. You're just totally depleted. And it's hard to, to get it back up. So it's very important to take take the time to know when to say, I can't do everything, to say, okay. Or I need to do something different. I need to read for a bit. I need to watch some great movies. I need to watch, understand, read some books on great directors and how they manage things. So there's a lot of self-care involved in that. And, uh, you know, one, one story that comes to mind, I think people have probably heard it, it's the... Uh, it's the psychiatrist talking to his patient and his patient's talking about how depressed he is and how hard it is. And the do- doctor, so, uh, you know, psychiatrist goes, I know what you need. What you need to see is, uh, you need to go and see this, this great clown. He's fantastic. He's Pigliacci. He's great. And he'll, he'll lift your spirits up and, you know, you'll feel 100% better after you go see him. And, 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 uh, and the depressed guy gets up on the couch and goes, yeah, doc, but I am Pagliacci. <laughs> right. so that's you know that's that's the that's the world that we live in we we give we give we give we give, but we also have to be very aware of when to it's okay not to give all the time it's okay to be selfish and look after yourself and look after others around you in your orbit you know because you have to keep that balance because if you keep giving people will keep taking you know they may not be aware but they'll keep taking but you got to know when to say okay i need this for me. I need to go here. I need to go away for a while. I need to, I need to read. I need to, you know, learn how to play something different. I need, I need, uh, you know, that's why when I, when I was doing that corner gas at the end of a season of corner gas, I would, I, I'd, uh, talk to, uh, my artistic director friends and go, Hey, let's do something. Let's do a play. So when I ended, I'd have a month off and then I would do a play, which was totally different from my Davis character. Right. And, and, and that was for me. That was for me because I needed to flex my other acting muscles. And it was a chance to play, you know, Sam Shepard's True West, to play the Lee, the drifter, the hard guy, which was very interesting because when we did it, when we did it live in, 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 the, in the theater and the audience, lights come up. And I knew this would happen. So I told the director, I said, you know, before we just start right into it, give me, uh, let me have a bit of time up the top to establish to the audience that I am not the TV guy that you saw. <laughs> I am not Davis on stage. And he, he was kind of like, huh, really? And I go, yeah. And it, would, and it was, we came out and I could hear the tittering and oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I would, you know, down a beer really quick and throw the, crush the can and just throw it away and swear a little bit and then storm around and then we'd start to play and people were like, oh, right, it's not the same. Okay, he's not, he's not playing Davis here. <laughs> Yeah, and then I would go and strangle and beat somebody up and stuff. So it was hard for people because they love Davis is such a great character that they, you know, they had a hard, some people had a hard time just letting that go and go, Oh, he, he can do other things. Right. 
I want to get there, but I do want to ask about which emotion is the hardest to portray, to message out. We all, I think, as audience members, think crying and emotion and sadness is the hardest one for people to portray on stage or on film. Which one, from your perspective, is the hardest to, to let out and to share? Uh, yeah, being vulnerable is, is, always, uh, is always a challenge. Uh, shedding tears on stage because it's it's very vulnerable. You're opening yourself up and you're and you're not criticizing, commenting yourself. So you're very vulnerable spot, and it's hard to do, especially in a play where you have to do it, uh, you know, eight times a week and twice on Wednesday and twice on Saturday or whatever, you know. Um, so it's it's that's a hard one, and also doing comedy is very hard if you don't. And it's always a, a chore, and it's always exciting because you always get to to build and and find out, try and find out uh, how you can how 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 a difference something as as small as like a shoulder shrug. You get a big laugh with the shoulder shrug. You get a bigger laugh if you don't. <laughs> you know, and so it's playing with those levels and seeing how how you can how you can get the best journey out, out of this without 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 going overboard, without being ridiculous, you know? How did Corner Gas come about for you? Oh, I, I auditioned along with like 300 other people uh, in, in, in Toronto. I, I walked into the room and there were all shapes and sizes there. All There was uh, male, female, you know, bald, long hair, brown, white. There was all kinds. So they were just looking uh, for a, a combination, I guess, a blend. Because uh, I, I I went in and had to, did a scene with another actor who I'd never met before, never worked with. We were paired together and auditioned as Davis and Karen in the one scene. And the uh, the character that well, the gal who was was doing made some choices that were a bit like I was like, oh, <laughs> you you do oh okay, uh, which is hard not to be affected by it. But I'm in the room, so I just uh, I, that's why I went. To, I, I use my clown training for Davis more to get into that state of just innocence, like experience for the first time. Everything was for the first time, discovery for the first time. Uh, so that's where I was living, and this person was was doing a caricature uh, of a tough of a tough broad. <laughs> so it was kind of so you know I just didn't did did my thing and tried to interact with the person there and just reacted to what they were giving and, and stuff and and. Uh, I think when, when we, the way Davis was written was he was the sergeant dealing with a flighty rookie. He was the sergeant in charge dealing with a flighty rookie. That's the way it was written, as I recall. Um, and then when we, our first, when I finally got the job, I went to Regina and met uh, Tara Spencer Nairn, who played Karen, for the first time. And we, and we decided to walk to the studio together just so we can have a yap and visit and get to know each other a little bit in our, you know, four block walk to the studio. And, uh, and somewhere in that walk, we somehow flipped it where she became the grounded one in charge. And I was the flighty sergeant in charge, you know, and she was the real, she was the real smarter cop of the two. And I was like the flighty sergeant. So somehow we'd managed to, to, to flip the portrayals and there is the writers and producers are like, Oh, I guess, yeah, I guess that could work. And we're kind of like, yeah, you know, it just, it just kind of came naturally. So it was, uh, lucky that way. But yeah, I, I auditioned along with everyone else. And, uh, I was, uh, I had one, one thing is I knew one of the producers I'd worked with him before and he kind of like made sure I was always uh, in a mix and they were, uh, that was the best thing they could have done. The producers was to hire actors. Because because Brent, uh, being coming from the stand up comic world, he wanted to hire all his stand up comedy buddies. But yeah. his yeah, but his producer, uh, the bosses, the producers, the brain said, you know, what you really want are actors who can bring the characters more to life than telling jokes. You know, they may be good at telling jokes, but when you're playing a character, there's more to it than just saying your funny lines and you know there's there's a whole bringing uh three d's to a two-dimensional character so so uh, lucky brent was smart enough to go oh, okay so that's when you audition all, all those actors and you know we got to they got really lucky and cast eight eight people who we worked really well together 
and uh, you know we had mutual respect for each other and uh, and an and incredible amount of skill between all of us so everyone had a lot of theater training and and knew their knew their business so it was it was fun to play with when you're working with a team of pros it makes it a lot easier this is somewhat unique, right? Because not very often do you go to a town somewhat in the middle of nowhere and film a show. Can you talk to us, talk to us about the logistics of filming something like this? Yeah, it's a, it requires, it's a, it's a big move. You, you have to, cause I was living in Toronto at the time. So I had to basically move to Regina for three, four months while we did the, uh, while we did the show. We would base out of Regina and go to, and drop to Rollo every day to work or, down the street to the studios. So we had like a 60, 40 split, 60% was filmed in Rolo and and 40% was filmed in studio. So there were days where it'd be like four or five days driving out to Rolo all the time. And then the other time would be in studio, which would be easier. Well, yeah, easier, just a little more time. We'd be shooting in studio on set and stuff. And, and you didn't work all the time. You didn't work eight, you know, eight days a week with eight days. To film a half hour episode is what it took us. And we did two half hour episodes at a time. So you're not working all the time. So sometimes you get two days out of the eight. Uh, and we were Monday to Friday bankers hours, you know, and, and <laughs> Monday to Friday, we long weekends up and, and stuff. So sometimes you might not work for like a week. Yeah. And it's just the way it, how much your character played or not. And, and in that time, so you could, you could fly back to Toronto, go home for a little bit or which was very hard because. The amount of travel takes it out of you too, because it takes a while to get to the airport and then fly to Toronto and then a while to get home. And then you, you're at home for two days and then you got to reverse it and come back. And, and it's like really, you know, <laughs> because you were traveling. So, you know, and then you come back. Why am I tired? It's like, cause you didn't get any rest. And it's like, ah, okay. But uh, yeah, so you, you know, that's a schedule that you get on and you learn how to, uh, you know, schedule your life around that kind of kind of uh demands and and it's yeah reading the script so it's always important when you're doing especially when you're doing tv because time is money <laughs> in that world there's no time there's no chance for oh let's let's rehearse this forever and ever it's like no no you'll get two three shots at it and then we're recording it so learn your lines learn the blocking and uh be prepared you know don't don't think you're going to get time to learn your lines while you're there, it's like, no, your job as the actor is to be prepared. So when you show up on set, you know the scenes you're doing, you know your lines, and then you, you can work. But if you show up and they, oh, I just learned it on the day, it's like, no, then you're hamstringing everyone else. You're hamstringing your, 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 uh, scene partners, the other actors you're working with, because they're ready. They're prepared. And if you think, you know, and then you're, you're holding up a crew. You got 150 people waiting around on you to learn your line. So if that's your attitude, then find a different line of work. You know, it's a team, it's a team effort. It's a team sport. Everyone has a job to do and the crews do theirs incredibly well. You know, world-class crews. Uh, so you disrespect them if you're not prepared to do your part. So that's what actors should know is that there's other people involved. It's not all about you. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> Who is Davis Quinton from your perspective? What do you see in the character? Oh, he's, uh, I love playing him because, and, and he was a challenge because he is two dimensional character, right? You never find out where he's from. We never ventured down that road. We never ventured into his past life or like where he went to school and, and or his love lives or anything like that. So he's very two dimensional that way. So the challenge was always was how to make him three dimensional without, without going into that other background. So that's where. It, it was uh, it was a joy to play in that in innocence because I just lived in the innocence and and he was passionate. He was very passionate about whatever came across his plate. It was like you know, organize a wedding. Oh yeah, I love it. You know, <laughs> ride around in the little cars. Yes, be a member. Oh yeah, that's that's what he that's where he lived. You know, that's what he loved was that uh, was the excitement of everything. He was very passionate about whatever whatever crossed his plate. So. That's that's where I live. Was keeping that freshness alive in him, and the innocence, and the purity. So he he didn't swear. He didn't. You know, he wanted to be part of the 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 camera club. He called it the security cam. You know. Yeah. Um, so that was that was the that was the challenge and the treat of playing that guy was was, was uh, bringing that alive and, and living in that. Because yeah, you know, he he didn't know what was coming around the corner or 
what he thought. He just knew that he loved it or he didn't. It was exciting or it wasn't. <laughs> so you have the signature, all right. I yeah. have to know where where does this come from? Is this something you developed? Is this something that they proposed to you? How did that come about? That uh, that happened just the way I delivered it. Um, it was just written all right, but I kept dragging it out. And they were telling me, can you just make that little? And I went, no, because it's all right. You know, it's exciting. This is what he wants to do. This is this is his joy. This is this is you know that's his sign of something. Things are good when he's in the all right mode. All right, it's exciting. Let's go. You know, so so I couldn't shorten it. I I couldn't. I found myself trying a few times saying all right. And it's like no, it needs that thing, and it turned in you know into what his tagline, which was unintentional, but it just fit, and I just couldn't shorten it. I was just like, no, it's speak, it's speaking for myself, you know, it's speaking for David's going, no, we don't say, all right, we say, all right. <laughs> exciting. Is there a point in time where you realize the impact that this is having on people across Canada, that this is really gaining traction with a strong uh, community of people who really enjoy the show? Is there a point? Yeah, there was a, uh... I think after the first season that aired, I was living in Toronto and I got a, a walk by laughing. Somebody walked by carrying the groceries. They looked at me and went, <laughs> and I was going, what, what? And like, I didn't know. I didn't know how many people were like, how, how it affected people. I had no idea, but it would start happening more frequently. People would come up to me and, and they'd lean in very conspiratorially and go, Hey, that's a great show, man. And you know, I mean, and, but the common thing I found out was a lot of people who loved it, uh, especially in Toronto, were were not from Toronto. They were they were from small towns all over Canada. It reminded them of people they grew up with. It reminded them of their hometown that they were that they came from. You know, a lot of urban centers are full of small town people. You know, and that's what the the love for it. You know, I had, I had a police chief come up to me in, in a in a hotel in, in Saskatoon and. He leaned over and, and I, and I wanted to make sure, cause I was, I didn't want people to think I was making fun of the cops cause they have a tough job as it is. And I didn't want to be disrespectful to them in any way. So I said, this is what I told the police chief. I said, I hope you're not offended or I'm uh, being offensive. Uh, to your ego and hell. Actually, you remind me of a lot of people I work with. <laughs> I went, oh, okay, it's good. And the taser exercise or the taser episode we did, uh, I, I have had like three or four cops come up and go, you know who else did it? This guy right here. <laughs> the guy's like, yeah, I accidentally tased myself. And I was like, oh, well, I, I thought I just made something up. But no, it happened. There's cops out there actually got tased. And, <laughs> and there was, and, and that was, I think the most, uh, now well, heart wrenching things I, I heard were from people in the military, and, and when they were in Afghanistan, they were talk, uh, a couple of the members came up and said, "You know, when we were being rocket attacked, we'd go into our bunkers and we'd have to stay there till we give the all clear. Something we'd be there for hours, and uh, somebody would, you know, bring in the laptop, and someone had a quarter gas uh, disc." And they throw it in. They'd be laughing as they're being rocked. They'd be, they'd get a bit of home, and they would get laughter as they're being attacked by rockets. You know, so it's just like so. They said thanks, and I was just kind of like, wow, that's that's to me, that's my job. That's what we what we're there for is to bring uh, entertainment, laughter. Laughter is good medicine. You know, we've had a lot of people who are ill or are going through a tough time in their life. And they turned to corner gas for levity and escape and, and relief and just seeing goodness. And that's, and that's what I love about that show is our, our characters were just the epitome of goodness, you know, having grandparents saying they loved it because they could watch it with their grandchildren and laugh together, forming a new bond on a multi generational level, you know, it's just like, wow, we did that, you know, the writers and the actors and our crew, we did that. We put that out there. We put our hearts into it. And, and people received it. So it's just, it's, it's an awesome gift to be part of that experience. That's beautiful. Can yeah. you tell me about the difference between doing that and the animated series? Obviously, you're, you're more focused on your tone and your sounds. How different was that experience? Well, the, the difference was that the writers were more unleashed. 
because they could write scripts that they didn't have to uh, worry about building sets. You know, they could talk about Sasquatch and unicorns and not worry about having to build where they live and stuff they? because they can just draw it out, right? So they got things got a little little zany and and uh, and, and and funnier in the animated version. You know, <laughs> I don't know if you've seen one, but they they do a Mad Max thing with Oscar driving by in the hockey mask. <laughs> You know, and it's just like that's brilliant. You know, so it was fun that way, and being in studio with the, with those guys it was it was a great chance to keep connected. And because we'd be in Vancouver, a bunch of us, and then the other bunch would be in Toronto, and we'd just do it over the uh, over the over the airwaves. So it'd be nice to get a visit in, and everyone would be laughing and stuff. And then we'd do the episodes, and then we would okay, see you next week for the other ones, or see you in a couple of weeks, and so it was good. Was it hard for the chapter to close? It's come to an end now. There is no plan, as far as I know, for this to continue. Was it hard to say goodbye to this character and to this this chapter? Um, yeah, it's it's hard because of the memories and then the other uh, missing being around. There's there's other great human beings that was part of for almost close to twenty years. There's uh. You know, and the characters you miss, you miss the characters and stuff. But mainly, I miss the the crew and the and my other castmates. You know, we we keep in touch now and again. Uh, Eric uh, Peterson and I just did a debaters for CBC. You can check that out on their website. There's peanuts versus pretzels. So it was a great chance to have a visit with Eric, and then you know we got to play a little bit, and uh, it was awesome. Um, but yeah, and I miss, and, and of course, we miss Janet Wright as well, who passed away, and you know she was a, she was a big heart of it, big big part and a big heart. Uh, so you know, missing her all the time. So yeah, lots of good memories. But you know, it's uh, and, and, you know now there's there's a whole generation, a new generation of Corner Gas fans. You know, it's 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 mind blowing sometimes going hearing a twelve year old kid say, "Oh, you're my favorite character." I go, you weren't even around when we did this. <laughs> oh, okay. But it is, it's timeless. You know, you watch it over again because you, know, you missed the jokes, some of the jokes the first time around because there was, uh, the performances were pretty layered in a lot of them. So some very fine, fine work by, uh, you know, the the cast there on, on how to how to tell a story, how to tell a joke, how to set it up. And it was it was tons of fun, tons of fun to play. My last question, sort of on the same note, is just around your skills as an actor. You sort of already touched on it, that you're multidimensional and you want to be able to showcase different styles, different different approaches, different viewpoints, different mm-hmm. characters. And sometimes I imagine you get typecast as, as Davis, as this individual. Was that a struggle at all? Was there ever a period where that was like, I don't want to just be this character. I am multidimensional. I'm capable of so many things. Was that ever a challenge? It's always a challenge. It's still a challenge now. And it's, it, and it's, um, it's, yeah, I, I would turn down work that would, you know, it was comedy based right after, especially after a season. I, I'd be offered something, you know, it's a comedy and I go, no, I'm, I'm, I've done comedy for the last, you know, six months. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I, I want to do something else. And that's what I, I would go and look for the challenge. I would go find it or make it myself for myself to do to exercise because I know not what I needed. Um, but it's still hard, you know, it's, it's, it's still difficult to get, uh, in this business. It's very, uh, look oriented. So it's hard to get out of the, you know, we're looking for an indigenous guy. And it's like, well, are you looking for a human being when this age range? Cause I can play that guy. You know, it doesn't have to be an indigenous this or an indigenous that. It's like, I don't want to be that. Can you say more on that? Because I think that that's really important that people understand that indigenous people or when you personify something, that you're not just that. You are a multi-layered individual that's capable of so many different things. And I don't yeah. think we hear that very often. Yeah, no, I, it's it's something I, I keep working on is, is, uh, it, it's, is to express, to find uh, find stories to tell and find different ways to tell it from a human universal nature. Uh, and that's what I, I keep, you know, uh, hoping that people will understand is that this stories I like to share, stories I like to, to read are human stories. And I think that, and if it is, you know, and there's ways that I can uh, inject my creeness into things, that's what I do. That's where I come from. That's where I start my work from. 
but I don't focus it at all on the sweat lodge or the uh, the medicine wheel. It's like I'm 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 more than that. I'm trying to get more into uh, uh, yeah, just connecting with the human humanity of the human species and telling stories and sharing great stories. Like you know, I like to uh, on my. We're starting, we're starting uh, getting a YouTube channel going, and, and on that YouTube channel, I'm going to be sharing some uh, some sonnets, some scenes from Shakespeare plays, and some uh, some stories from uh, uh, Rudyard Kipling, or you know, all those lines. stories that by writers who influence me. Yeah, you know, and and yeah, and and talking more like with yourself here about uh, uh, you know just the humanity of things, you know, of, of just being talking about issues that affect every every human being on, on this planet we all come from somewhere but we also have the same emotional journeys we all have the same uh, feelings you know the same wants and stuff and uh yeah uh most most of my stuff i'm just reading some notes or <laughs> um people could find uh my stuff on the youtube channel is you know getting my youtube channel up and going at lauren cardinal uh, uh youtube.com at slash lauren cardinal i think that's how the kids say it <laughs> yeah or any any of my social media that you you find uh, uh is that lauren cardinal so i'm pretty easy to find yeah and and uh those kind of things will link uh right to the youtube so last question for you is around the lauren cardinal theater yeah can you tell us about how this came about for you and what it means to you to have a theater named after you? Yeah, that was a that was a huge uh, honor and surprise because uh, usually they name places after people who have passed. So I was quite shocked and quite honored. Uh, you know, the Roxy Theater, the theater network, theater company in Edmonton. So. Um, it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful spot, and uh, it's just, um, it, it's a huge honor. So it's it just, I obviously been doing doing some things right, and uh, and I keep keep going down that path. So keep trying to uh, let people know and see that anything is possible. Uh, everything is possible if if you want it bad enough, you can you can get it done, no matter where you come from. You know, I, I when I do. Uh, talk to kids in schools and stuff. I let them know I'm from Sucker Creek, Alberta, and I never thought I'd be, you know, uh, working in movies with Al Pacino and, you know, Robin Williams and, and those kind of people. But once I found what I was meant to do, I went and pursued it to find out how I could be successful at it. And like in anything that people try to choose, training is the most important thing. Learn your craft, learn your technique of whatever it is you're doing whether it be a cook or a carpentry or a mechanic or whatever, there's technique and craft involved to be the best. And that's all you, and that's all I strive to do is just trying to be the best storyteller I can be the best, um, how I can contribute to this story I'm telling. I, I'm not, uh, when early in the business, I was, I was thinking about, you know, accolades and awards and, and reviews, and, but it's not, uh, those things, come or or they don't but that's not why i'm in it so that i had to you know but it's it's a it's a thing it's a human thing to to want to be recognized for what you do but i realized uh, after a while that uh i don't worry about that i more worry about telling the story more worried about telling the truth in in a great way because then the rest will come uh, it'll take care of itself um i did i did a play in toronto and uh, that was one of the things I was worried about because it was such a great play. It was wonderfully written. And uh, I got to play this great ghost character. So I was doing all this stuff and I had longer hair. So I was using my hair in the performance and doing all these things. And I was and I was thinking to uh, about myself going, oh, man, I can't wait to see how they review it, what they'll say, what the theater people will say. And, of course, the newspaper people came and they saw it and they went, oh, it's too heavy. They, you know, they could use some levity and it's just like, we can't win. <laughs> We're trying to tell our story and it's a heavy story. Yeah, because suicide happens a lot in, 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 in our communities, you know, and this is the story we're telling. It's about these guys and it's about suicide. So 
so the newspaper people tell us where we should do more comedy and try and be funny. And uh, and I was like all bummed out about it. It's like oh, now it's this and that. And then we're changing in this little back area, just separated by a blanket. And this guy pops his head, and young Ishnabi guy pops his head, and he goes, "Hey, you guys, how are you doing?" We're going like. Mm. Good. <laughs> We're just changing. And he goes, yeah, yeah, no, I, I just wanted to say uh, thanks for the show. It means a lot, you know. And I'm like, oh, yeah, good, good. And he goes, yeah, yeah, because uh, my best friend killed himself, uh, you know, a month ago. And we're kind of like, oh, geez, sorry to hear that. He goes, yeah, yeah, I know. And I was thinking of doing the same thing. But uh, but now seeing your show, uh, you know, I've been changing my mind about that. So thanks. Thanks, guys. And then he was gone. And we're like, and for me right there is that that's the point. That's why I do it. That's why I tell the stories that I tell the plays that I do, because you never know who's watching it, who will be inspired, who will who will you know, change the course of the life. That's why I've always, you know, when when P, I've always got ch- uh, time to say hello to somebody, to stop for a minute to look at people, because you know my dad taught me that. He he was a medicine man, teacher, elder, wise guy, and. uh and he did a lot of work with people and, and, and he always had, uh, a chance whenever he, he'd always have time to say hi to somebody who was on the street. He says, cause they're human beings. We're human beings. There's nothing that makes me better than him. He said, he's having a hard go. What's, what's wrong with stopping to acknowledge his humanity, one human to another, just to say, Hey, or sorry, or, Oh, sorry to hear that. Or say, no, I don't have any money. Or just to acknowledge them as a human being is a is a gift. So that you know those kind of teachings I I, I keep in in my brain because yeah I just people put an effort to watch something that I do and I'm grateful for them watching and if they they get something from it entertainment or a laugh or a tear or whatever um, thanks for coming along on the ride I appreciate it I'm glad I can help people out in in times like that to ease their pain a bit or make them laugh or bring their family together that's that's all. You know, it's a it's a gift to be able to give them that opportunity to help people that way. So hmm. I cannot thank you enough for being willing to do this. You're an absolute inspiration. All of your responses have been so thoughtful. I I find your story and your journey really inspirational, and I think it's important that we highlight individuals like yourself who lift up a voice share stories and encourage us to do the same. And I think we're just so lucky that there are individuals out there like you who are helping people with their audiobooks, who are sharing positive stories and helping people find themselves on this journey and giving some people some solace. So thank you again for being willing to do this. Hi, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And and uh, yeah, you know, getting a chance to work with Bruce McIver is it's another, like I'm a history buff too. I love history and I, especially our history because it is quite, it's a wide breadth, and, and uh, my family was involved in a lot of it back in the 60s. Uh, my dad, my, my grandfather, my Muslim, and my uncle, uh, they were all involved in the red paper back in the 60s and the 70s, and my, my grandfather in the 40s, when the formation of, of getting Indigenous rights recognized, treaty rights, going, hey, you guys haven't fulfilled your end yet, and this is back in the 40s, when it was illegal for Indigenous people to gather in groups of more than two. And they went to Ottawa. A group of Indians went to Ottawa in the 40s and made, made Parliament change the rule just so they could have come in as a delegation to say, hey, you're, you haven't fulfilled our treaty rights for water, power, you know, housing, you know, basic necessities that they, they, they said they would. So, you know, we've been involved in that struggle and it still continues to this day. So it's, uh, you know, I come from a, a long line of people who work work for the people lauren cardinal find him on facebook instagram youtube is there any other places people should go looking for you oh it's anywhere they want yeah youtube uh, instagram uh, yeah and, and if you go to the youtube channel you can sign it there's a link there to click and you'll get onto my long-term mailing list so yeah subscribe at youtube and then and then sign up at laurencardinal.com. I'm getting my social media instructions here. <laughs> yeah. And all my social media can link to all the YouTube channel and everything. You can find me there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.